Okay. So this piece uh, has a couple of issues with it. Um, the first one is this weird double image deja vu we're having. Um, one of them is the most important. He's the most forward, and he's got his buddies in the back, and you've leveled them on different levels, which is excellent. Uh, but we've just, we're trying to create a difference between all of these levels that you have the exact same pose for both of them. So what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to go ahead and flip this guy. Okay. I think flipping him will get rid of that weird deja vu and will kind of make this a little easier to look at. It's just very unusual to have this exact image just on the other side. Very, very weird. Very uncanny. Like there's just a rip in the in, in space and we're just seeing a reflection from another point in time. It's very unusual. So let me see how much I need to hide. Alright. So this reflection here will help kind of give us variety and gesture. I'm not sure why you duplicated the exact same pose for two different guys. It's very, very um, disruptive to the composition to have two exact shapes. If you want to duplicate both, you are doing it with design purpose. If you did it accidentally and you didn't notice you were doing it, again, it's very, uh, very, very unusual. Just taking care of his sword right over here. I'm just gonna fix the background. And then we're talking about this um, like combination of cool and dark. So it's a nighttime scene, but it's a nighttime scene lit with a blue sky. I mean, a, a really strong moon. That strong moon in this dark scene has made the sky green. You have a green filter here. The green filter is not an appropriate color to use for nighttime. It is appropriate when we're talking about artificial light, like floodlight. Um, at that point, it will behave like a green. But nighttime, the color itself that is most dominant at night, which is the richest color in its darkest form, blue and navy, um, those are the last colors that kind of s exist outside uh, at, at nighttime. Those are the last colors. We never have pitch black. It's never pure black. It's always a shade of blue. And that cool filter just is a reflection of the fact that we have a lack of the warm filter that we usually get. So I'm shifting that over. Um, as for these pieces here, they've shifted over into the greens. So that's fine. Metal is reflective. Metal is almost specular. It behaves like a specularity, which is um, uh, or something reflective like water. Uh, so what it does is it reflects the natural color of the object nearby, the natural color of the light source. If the natural color of the light source was a flame or just a general warm light, you don't need to have this green. I mean, you don't need to have this pure yellow. In fact, it's going to be a very whitish orange. So we're going to start by desaturating accordingly. I know this guy is now completely the wrong color, so I'm going to desaturate him completely on this side to be that moonlight color and then bring in that yellow on the other side. All right, so I'm desaturating. <clears throat> and what you're doing right now is you're telling me that this bounce light, this cool, this warm light nearby somewhere is strong enough to illuminate him, which is on the farthest part of the, of the, of the, like the courtyard. And these guys, which are really close, have the same amount of exposure as he does. Do they each have their own little individual attachment light, like their own little pet light to, um, uh, carry around with them wherever they go? No, it makes no sense. That means that we have to show the light, we have, to, we have to give the light some weakness. Weakness in the light's radiation is giving, is the way to give light characteristics. So you give characteristics to light source by weakening them. It's okay to weaken a light source. It gives it characteristics. Write that back. Right, so I'm just darkening. 
right over here. He doesn't need to be bright all around. He's all the way in the back. He's, he's the closest to the primary light source, which is the moonlight. So he can have a couple more little shines here on his helmet. But as for him having the same amount of warm light on his, um, on his armor as the guys who are right beside this flame or this burning flame, then it's not going to make any sense at all. Um, I'm just going to, I don't know why this decided to be green, but I'm just going to go ahead and color that back into like a warm or just like a general gray scale. <clears throat> All right, so now we've taken care of that. There's no weird twilight zone happening over here. I'm going to have to start bringing in some smoke. There's a lot of fire nearby. So me bringing in this smoke is going to help differentiate between these levels of depth. We're saying that one of these guys is further than the other, and it just keeps happening across the canvas. So right here, in between the space they, in between the space between them, the space in between them, I'm going to start bringing in a fog in the background. So first I'm going to, what the hell is that? First I'm going to bring in that fog. So I'm just going to choose a cool gray um, type smoky color, but I'm going to bring it in from the browns only because the fire is causing this. So it's going to be a little bit more of a brownish gray tone, just like that. And I'm going to bring it in in a new layer. All right, so I need to create some depth in between these guys. And then in a new layer, I'm only doing this in different layers so I can have control. I'm going to throw some smoke over this fella, and then I'm going to throw some smoke over this guy too. Erasing this guy, giving him perfect edges because he is at the center of the canvas. He is exactly center, which isn't mature design-wise. It's a very immature thing to do uh, to your canvas, to center everything, but it is, it is uh, a way to create some kind of depth, so I'm going to consistently raise this smoke up just so we have less contrast on this guy and even less on this guy. And then perfectly like behind him, I'm going to also try to just lighten that space behind him. Yeah, it's nighttime, but you know, nobody films at night. Nobody actually films at night. You always need some kind of light to film. Um, and we're filming right now. We're filming him. We're filming what's happening to him, around him. And that means we need some kind of rules of sunlight, rules of exposure here, just to help us differentiate him from his environment. Or else we're just, it's just a nighttime scene. Like, who films at night? You're going to get nothing but darkness. It reminds me of a joke on this video on YouTube. This guy is like, you know, take a look at this guy wrestling a bear at night, and it's just a black scene. <laughs> well, you know, they don't have to actually film it or get CGI because uh, because it's just it's just a black scene because <laughs> you can't see anything at night. But he was he was definitely definitely uh, wrestling a bear for sure. All right, so I'm just gonna raise some of that smoke behind him. So they can be separated from his background. And then finally, at the very end, I'm going to bring smoke in front of this guy, but only at the base. That way we've created some kind of surface environment, some kind of surface texture. Everything is nice and cool compared to where it was before, which is very green, if you can see. Very, very green. Very unusually turquoise. Now it's a bit more cool. And now I'm going to start thinking about that color, that warm color. So I'm going to bring these yellows down even further, just all the way, and I'm going to warm those flames in the background. And what did we say about flames at night? They have, they, they're definitely bright, but they're more of a yellowy orange than a red orange, but they're definitely not a green yellow. They're still very, very warm. But there's a blue filter they have to pass through. Let me see if color dodge works nicely for that. Right, and there's those guys in the background, very, very dim. And then I'm going to establish the strength of this moonlight that is off scene, which is very, very nicely done. 
This moonlight has to be off scene. And the reason being is you can't just have a big glowing light bulb there demanding the focal point um, over the, the rest of the image, which has actual focal uh, detail cluster in it. So it's good to throw, very mature choice, throwing the moon off screen. I'm going to throw some glow and bloom off this guy's helm, off this guy's, this guy's. This guy has more of that heroic shine like the conqueror. And then now I'm going to bring in that yellow, that fiery, flamey yellow. So we're going to start with color dodge. I mean, just color layers, sorry. I'm going to bring in the exact kind of orange this flame is throwing off. And I'm going to start by just throwing in one massive just glow or fog of yellow. This is going to go down eventually. Then get another color layer with more opacity. And then I'm going to start warming up half of every side of this. This might not be the perfect temperature for the color, but it's definitely a starting point. I'll adjust the temperature out or the, and the hue of the color in a second. But it cannot be so strong that it has like no fading, it has, doesn't fade across the canvas. So it does need to be more green. Color, color layer doesn't provide you with the same color you chose. You kind of have to just keep adjusting over and over and over. Actually, this guy right here, his helmet is too dark all the way around. His helmet actually needs to get lighter just around the edge. It's a bit too dark all the way. In fact, the very top of the helmet's tip should be the one that gets light, not the side of the helmet. So basically what I mean is the tip right here should be getting the highlight and not the side. Do you see that? You threw it on the side instead, which kind of makes no sense because it's just not sticking out far enough to capture that bounce light to begin with. Um, that's going to be your choice. What you want to do is too much. I'm going to be changing too much if I do this and I don't have the time to completely edit this, but look out for that. That This side here isn't really getting, that's not a subsurface scattering or a fabric, it's a reflective surface. But that area is definitely bothering me. And then I throw that there. I'm going to merge the two. And then I'm going to oversaturate and make sure I choose the right kind of color. So I'm just greenifying the color as you can see. Because pure, unless it's like this kind of magical red, which is kind of cool, uh, but you want natural colors, you want natural environment. And this is the color that I chose, which was two oranges, you can see. I even greenified it when I was choosing the color, but because of color layer, you're not going to get the exact color. So now I have to greenify it even more. And it's not a full green, it's just a yellow green compared to this, which was two red. Zero, full green. Whoops. That looks, that looks hella cool, but you can't, I don't know. If you want to use that color, go ahead. But you're going for a flame. So full green, the color we had, and I'm just going to choose something in between. Okay. You also have this option, this really, really cool option, which is just go full blue. That's also a really, really valid value to choose. It might be just a magical color, also because I really love blue. Um, but if you wanted that whole warmy flame color, then you got to go for this value right over here, the one that we chose. Okay, um, so those are my corrections. Let's take a look at the before and after and see what they've provided. So you had that double vision with the, with the two guys, both facing the same direction. They're all facing in the same direction except the head of the last guy, um, but I wanted not to have the exact duplicate gesture, so I flipped him. I also changed the color of the environment to be more navy. So you had very, very green light and very, very green environment. Now you have a little bit of both. What I recommend 
it's just no green at all. Just make it another white. Just make it like a nearby, like a lake or something reflecting water or something. I just don't recommend that yellow. The reason being is because you have some in the background already and you have that red in the scarf. So you're already breaking the monochromatic value thing that you're probably worried about. You also have a lot of yellow in the design of the armor, which is getting completely lost if you add that yellow in that you had before. So also the sizing of these guys is a little bit off too. So before, after, now we have some smoke differentiating them from each other. We have some smoke behind him. It's not just fully dark. Um, none of that awkward yellow. I just made it completely white. Okay, as for this dude, um, the placing of everything, you have a very, very awkward shot cinematically. Um, you, you are trying to force only legs as visible. So it's like the camera is low in such a way and the guys are posed in such a way that the cameraman made sure we saw none of their knees. It's like a very deliberate hiding of their knees, which feels very, very awkward. Um, if the horizon line was just over here, and he's so close to the camera when the photo was shot that his knees weren't visible it doesn't mean that these guys also have to have invisible knees maybe these guys because of their position in the landscape and because of how far away they are we would see some of their knees but i feel if these guys walked up beside this guy one of them would be this tall and the other would probably be this tall compared to him he's like the shortest of them all so in order for it to make sense with what you're doing, I really just, I would just love to completely enlarge this guy all the way. So he looks even scarier and he looks more like a conqueror. Just like that, maybe overlap him on one of the guys. Because they all seem so perfectly positioned, so perfectly away from each other, um, in such a way that it's like you deliberately are trying to avoid painting the knee part of the armor which as a teacher makes a lot of sense students don't like painting anything below the waist anything where anatomy gets more difficult that's kind of like the alert mode the alert that I get um, in teacher mode like I yeah that student doesn't know how to draw knees or doesn't have a reference for for the leg part of the armor all right so I'm going to just figure this out over here so if you were going to hide the knees, you might as well just follow the perspective that you're supposed to be getting over here and just make him as large as he needs to be, hiding him and tucking him behind this guy. Even make him like this tall. This canvas now looks a little bit more appropriate um, than before where he felt like a little shorty. And if these guys caught up to him, they'd just be massive. And he's like a Lord Farquaad type of dude. He's so short. Every photo he takes, people have to be like leagues behind him. So he looks taller. <laughs> okay. So this, let's call this the Lord Farquaad look. <coughs> um, what's happening? Johnny needs to get shut down. All right, Johnny, you need to stop. <laughs> no more, no more what program. Johnny's out of control. All right, so before very awkward double vision um the color was so off the purple and all that green they were just not getting along then you have that purple with that yellow which are complementary tones tones again not getting along and now we're making everything analogous the purple matches that that kind of navy in the background this guy is looking in a different direction um he could use a little bit more highlights since he's much closer to that secondary light source than the other one um, so he could use a little bit of this, radially built, of course. I feel like you did double, I feel like you did copy-paste this guy's head. Um, it's just so awkward when they have the same amount, like the same exposure level. It just seems really, really awkward. Um, I'm going to give this guy's sword a little bit of a glow. This over here gets a little bit more. Just down here, though. Um, some reflection just along there. Wherever we have maximum exposure per form structure, that's what we're getting. So do you see how much more cinematically appealing it is to have this guy so large? 
Um, he's kind of off center too, which looks a lot better than that perfectly centered scene. And that nice and almost no man's land value in the background for the moon uh, is looking a lot better as well. I'm going to do one last little highlight down here. For any bit of smoke that is catching the secondary light, smoke also catches light and gets illuminated. And that's just over here to bring in more. So before, after. So which one scares you the most? Which one feels like he's just about to kick your ass? The one where he's enlarged and he's supposed to be this big considering that the camera is this low and those guys are in the background and he's that close to the camera. Um, or else it just, for me, it looks like an infant wearing you know armor that's too big for them. All right. Okay. So I'm just going to save that and look at something else. <clears throat> Um, let me delete that and get it out of the way. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm so sorry. All right, this piece. So what you have here is a bit like of a storybook exaggeration of the color theory. Uh, that's what storybooks do. They exaggerate the color theory. Um, so anywhere where you have cools, you got purple, full-on, saturated ass purple. It's just a little darker, of course. And then where you have, wherever you have highlights, you've got yellow or white yellow. But here you got a pink yellow, um, or I'm sorry, a pink light, a pink white. And that doesn't work. You had you went full purple on anywhere that wasn't touched by the light. Um, now you anything that is touched by the light has to have the same kind of yellow these clouds have. And that was the inconsistency that was kind of throwing me off. You had this inconsistency all around your color theory and your light. So I'm going to raise this up and shift it over into where are you yellows right there saturate that darken that you see how when we go full white and if we go high saturation there's no color but when we start darkening that's when we get color again that's because color needs a mid-tones need color pure white has no color in it or colors uh need mid-tones sorry all right so that yellow looks a little bit better um, that saturation is too high. I'm going to make it a bit more of a fun color here. As for the clouds, they're very pink and the sky is very, very dark. So it's supposed to be a really bright scene. We're seeing really, really bright lights and colors all over the image, but we're not seeing enough brightness to match that light environment. Do you see how Instantly it made sense. I'm also going to make that background color a little bit more green. Of course, the clouds are now selected oddly, uh, but at least the light environment matches. At least the, something is matching the light environment. As for the painting in general, what you've decided to put on the canvas, you have no cast shadows anywhere. There is no object that is casting a shadow on another. So what you could do is th throw this light source just slightly off center and just start casting some shadows. So this is casting a shadow on that. This is casting a shadow. Oh, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it properly. This is casting a shadow on that. Um, this is casting a shadow here along with this little attachment. And then it couldn't just be, you know, offset perfectly. It could be offset vertically as well. So we've got cast shadows this way, cast shadows this way, cast shadows off any awning, any kind of roof, cast shadows this way, cast shadows this way. And if you don't play with cast shadows, you don't really see how you could customize them. As far as you're concerned, um, you've never really had a need to, um, you know, that's not in your vocabulary to bring in interesting cast shadows. So, Christ. Oh, okay, thank God, it's still, wait, oh Lord in heaven. Okay. Oh, thank God. So I'm just throwing that cast shadow here and I'm going to cast those little shadows just over there. Do you see that? Isn't that nice? 
And then what I'm going to do to the areas that are dark, they're a little bit too dark, considering that all of these lit areas are this bright. So you made them pretty bright. I also lightened them just a little bit. So white doesn't isn't allowed to go full black like this or full dark like this, unless it's like a sunset scene or really, not even a sunset scene, unless it's like a super dark scene. It's allowed to go purple, but since it's white, it's not allowed to go that 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 light that dark but I'm gonna saturate the shadows it's gonna make it look a little more interesting and then we have the these pieces here which you've left as like a mattified suede texture they have absolutely no highlight to them and you're missing that extra little oomph of, of form because you're not highlighting this part of, of the of the uh, pyramid and that's that's sad it deserves a little bit as well so it's offset vertically, so all the shadows move up. But anywhere where we have part of a pyramid or half of a pyramid looking at the light, we illuminate that. This is all form studies, by the way. Okay, so I'm going to raise that up, saturate. Saturate. I'm oversaturating, don't worry, and I'm just going to move it into the yellow, something that looks a little bit more yellow, because that's what the light is doing. It's bringing in a yellow on top of the purple, the natural purple of that roof, and we're just getting this, like, a pink result. Yep, and that's it. And then now we have to work on these clouds in the background. All these clouds are equally just suffocating everything about this focal point. Some of these clouds have area that they do have atmospheric fade. Atmospheric fade happens on clouds. Write that back to me. There will still be air between you and any object, be it a cloud or a, or, you know, whatever it is, whatever's floating in the air. If there's enough distance between you, if there's enough air space between you and the object, there will be atmospheric fade happen on it. Just because it's a cloud and it is part of the atmosphere doesn't mean that it doesn't get faded off. So the way to medicate this suffocating kind of effect that they're having on the focal point, we're just going to fade them off into the sky blue. So I'm going to grab this exact color of the sky. Whoops. And just fade it. Fade it off. Um, let me see if I can start with the dark value. Shit, I'm gonna have to add everything. I'm gonna start with the biggest value, the highest value, then the second, and then the last one. Right, you see, nice and out of the way. It doesn't have to be some sort of crazy value. Um, it doesn't have to be crazy contrast, and the reason why it was suffocating the focal point is because we preserve focal points for the, uh, the, the I mean, we, we preserve contrast for the focal point. All right, I'm going to erase away it wherever there is a little bit of light. That is allowed to be there, just somewhat, not so much. And then right over here, this cloud piece is going to cast a shadow on itself right along here just like that. It's going to cast a shadow on itself just like this. Right. To give it some volume and then I'm going to smudge away so it fits right back in. All right, so it feels a little less uh, silly and cast shadow list. So you have like no cast shadows in your vocabulary right now. And that's a big disability. Um, you don't want that in your work. I'm going to desaturate the background. I'm going to saturate the whole painting. It's just way too saturated. The whole thing is just too saturated. Um, and then I'm going to desaturate anywhere where we have some whites down here. You, you have the right amount. You have the right idea. You have yellows, but they're just too yellow. 
It's almost like it's no longer a cloud. Remember, the natural state of the cloud is white. And it's getting purples because white reflects colors nearby it and the colors of the atmosphere. This has like no cast shadows on it, so I'm just going to throw a cast shadow over this whole cloud. I feel like it's low enough to get some. There needs to be some kind of cast shadow of some something nearby. Maybe the rock, actually, that's a good idea. Let the cast shadow of the rock kind of take over. Excuse me. I'm sorry, I sound very, very sick today. The worst of this will pass. I kind of want to talk about why I'm sick all the time, like in detail on YouTube, because everyone's always asking me. And I just feel like I'm really uh, not like telling you guys about it. Oops. This cloud is in front of this one, which means that this cast shadow goes here and gets cut off over here and then continues right back on the cloud. So let me try this again. Just like that. And it gets sharper and darker at the start and lighter and fuzzier near the end. Just like so. All right, and what do we do? We inherit the texture of the object receiving the cast shadow. So the cloud texture is what changes it. So you had the right, you know, you had a good attitude. You had like that storybook level saturation, storybook exaggeration of the color theory. But I feel like you had no real form behind you um, while you were trying all of these. You had no real form reinforcing the painting and reinforcing all of these beautiful little um, structures that you're going for. <clears throat> and smudge again, I'm just trying to trail this cast shadow here all around, all around down here as well. Wherever the light being offset vertically, wherever that, that does its thing. This little structure is just so awkward. I don't know what it's up to, what it's doing. Is this a cat? That's hard to tell. Um, over here, all of this needs to be sharpened. It's a part of the focal point, so it needs to get nice and sharp. So it doesn't look like it's floating off into the background. And I'm just going to bring in some sort of secondary bounce light here off these clouds, just down here. Select Immerse, just like that. Okay, and then I'm going to saturate all of these sides over here. So we are following the storybook thing where we saturate shadows just a little bit too much, just a little too much. Nothing crazy. You can now saturate these shadows because the background has dropped in saturation. You can saturate all these shadows in these funny little patterns. Um, just like that. You can have fun with it. Um, I don't think my saturation is too high. Just like that. Let me balance this and I'll be done. So your biggest problem was that you weren't really using um, the proper amount of uh, the, the other side of that color theory, which is the yellow white light source. You weren't really making that color theory work properly. You were just kind of, you thought pink and you just went pink. Um, and that's kind of why this, this fell off a little bit. kind of was too busy everywhere. It was hard to look at. Very, very, uh, like, cotton candy level um, saturation. 
And I'm just going to smudge the background some more. I feel like you should try to have even more of these uh, clouds overlap each other and try to make more happen there. Because they're, they're taking a massive portion of the canvas and they don't really have much interest happening there. They're not, nothing's really happening to them. Uh, one thing that's really fun to do with clouds, right over here, these cloud, this cloud range kind of overlaps. So this is exactly what you could do. You could just get a low opacity cloud brush or textured brush and just create that gradient as the clouds take over this edge. Over here as well, you can have them a little bit more transparent or translucent near the edges. They don't have to be like exactly set, which is why they did feel unnatural. They were um, not fuzzy enough. And then you have the fact that the entire building itself is in the midground and is in a very, very dense atmosphere. So what I would do um, is leave this for the background. So I would actually just completely throw this background away. Just because of how it's positioned, just because of its the way it's set in the distance. Do you see how now it feels like it makes sense to its environment? And then this is where you would bring in that character um, whose cape is flowing in the wind with rabbit ears and a funny little thin sword that's too big for him. And um, he's just standing there. <laughs> right, this is where you would bring that super dark foreground character. But him being, this, this cloud, this whole structure being faded off into the background where it belongs um, is exactly how this is supposed to be portrayed. If you don't like it, that far away and you want it to be less faded you have to make this take up more space because what you're telling me with the way you cropped it is it's in the distance don't worry about it if the cropping was a little bit more like that then you could leave it at this level because this is mid-tone level contrast but you have so much of the foreground showing it feels like this is exactly where this belonged right in the distance, fade it off into atmospheric fade like everything else. <clears throat> okay? Um, so you have this option. I, I, I wouldn't do this, um, but you know, there's just so much we can do with, with what, you, what you set up. I can try throwing off anything that is facing away from the light into some faded values. That's another effect you can do. Uh, another thing you can do is maybe there's a mountain nearby and you've got like a shadow traveling across the whole top of the mountain range. I mean this little thingy and uh, it's casting a shadow on everybody. Darken. And it's only light near the top um, and then that shadow just continues. If there was like a mountain nearby um, and then it kind of transfers from purple to bright fuchsia pink and then all the way up to yellow near the top. Um, but yeah, this is as much as I can do right now with the way you've set it up. Also, it's a vertical can, it's a tile canvas nearly. Um, and it's, you either make it a vertical book cover just like that, that is thrown off to one side more than the other. You can do it like this. Um, and the characters in the foreground looking in the distance with the faded with this faded um, backdrop and then you have just different levels of stonework or something in the foreground because this is taking up so much space in the canvas almost one fourth and it's just black it's just empty it's got nothing in it look if I throw this value on top nothing is revealed it's all just the same value so we've got before there's just too much happening. The background was dark. It didn't match the amount of light environment exposure on the clouds. They didn't match the light color on in the shot in the in the in the light areas. There that yellow in the clouds isn't there in the white of the uh, buildings. A white is white. It doesn't matter if it happens in a cloud or it happens in a building. White is white. It behaves the same all around. If there's yellow nearby, that white will inherit that yellow. 
White loves colors, uh, loves reflecting colors back. It doesn't hog any colors. And then after, before that. Okay, so super, super saturation. And you can make that sky just as saturated, but it has to be bright. It has to be a bright sky. So you can do this, exactly this. You can do that, but it has to be bright. Look at the value of that object, just the, just the value. I'm going to keep this darkish. Okay, you can make it this bright if you want to. So this this is too, too saturated. One thing you can do to bring back saturation is if you get into some details on the shingles, if the shingles are super bright. Another thing that brings in saturation is this mid-tone right here. Isn't that beautiful? If you have too much saturation everywhere, you don't get to use this saturation belt that surrounds cast shadows. You can take it all the way up into here and saturate the crap out of this. Right, right along here, saturate this shadow. It's just like the saturation belt that happens around cast shadow edges. And that's just because it's neither dark nor light, it's just mid-tones happening on that side. You can do that. And because the cast shadow is on a white object, we can lighten this up just a little bit. So do you guys have any questions? Make sure you write at Istabrak so I can see the question. <clears throat> yeah, do you have to get rid of the empty spaces? No, negative space is a beautiful thing, but if you're using negative space as a big black nothingness, it's not making any sense. Also, negative space, the black is supposed to be used for foreground. So if you maybe did something else over here and just made this less black, like, if you had just done this, that would have been a little bit more to deal with. Like, that would have been easier for me to deal with. And then you just have these weird little rock pieces um, like on each other. You just have some interesting rock structures or something like that. Some, just any, any, anything interesting. I wouldn't do what I just did. That was gross. Um, anything else, any cool little rock formation. Let me make it all like weird and balancey. That's something interesting. And you've got like a weird rock and it's got a wavy little flag on it. Cancel. Something like that. Anything, just anything in the foreground to make it feel like the foreground black was supposed to be used for something. That way we have, hey, middle ground background and then let's give the middle ground some attention as well. So middle ground is this right here. So it can be just a little darker, just just a little darker. But the space behind it so darken that just a wee bit. And then the space behind it right along here just this whole section minus this little weird thing I just drew and this can be lighter just around the base. I wouldn't do like rock and then two rocks and then two rocks. I would just try to do something interesting. So, oops. I, w I wouldn't do like uh, two rocks, two rocks. I would try to do like a th like one rock instead of two. So possibly just like get rid of this one or shift it, shift it over. And this is all stuff you explore in a thumbnail. Just like that. That's a little bit more interesting than having it perfectly mirrored two rocks on each other. Okay, and then this one in the distance can be just a touch more bright than anything we've seen here. 
because it's also getting faded the further it goes. And then you just have these beautiful ladders leading us into this um, distant little castle. <clears throat> and then you can bring in that funny looking uh, character with the ears and everything's flowing in the wind and he's got like his sword and it's like a big ass cloud sword and he's got his little monkey feet and he also has a skirt and he has a boot and he has a little cat that is his little ears are also flowing in the wind and <laughs> I'm having too much fun and his color is like super super saturated purple because we get to okay and you can just bring in a slight value drop just to make him a little more detailed so you can bring in full-on detail on this character here or something like that okay so that's what I see as the you know final form of this painting but you don't have to take it there of course you don't have to take all my suggestions um, but I do recommend you just try something just anything with with uh, with this kind of this kind of setup okay now if I saturate everything saturates pretty evenly um, I think that looks adorable it looks really similar to the kind of art and saturation level used on the uh, Sleeping Beauty uh, slides those background slides they had those panning panning frames I think it looks really pretty saturation is nice and balanced all around and then we have these these nice belts of saturation on the painting here on this cast shadow here it should probably be the same color I'm just gonna make it that purple color then I really want to draw that rabbit now <laughs> that rabbit warrior see I lost I lost that pretty cast shadow frame right over here I'll bring it back um also I, I just don't know what this rock is so I'm gonna get rid of it it's just such a random ass little rock I'm just gonna get rid of it it's getting in the way of the proper Simba rock we have here and it's not really fading into anything and I'm just going to fade it off I'm gonna I'm gonna fade both of these rocks off, rocks off. <laughs> all right this one gets faded and then that one goes even more faded this foreground rock might be a bit closer than the one beside it, so it can get even darker. Remember, saturate as you darken so that you can uh, build it up properly. And the picture will just get better and better. And where do we go to study our, our uh, rules of depth? We go to our form studies. But I'm going to undo all of this because it needs more work for it to look proper. So I'm going to leave that alone. But I, I do want you to see that you have potential there. Uh, you have potential for some more cloud structures just hovering. Some, some here, some in between the clouds, some in between the rocks, stuff like that. Anything where these rock clouds just continue creating depth and space between each um, ground level. All right. Um, so that's it for this one. Any questions at all? Let me, uh, before I close it, uh, when doing environments, how do you avoid the clip art effect by actually like, I know there's a clip art effect that happens when you do thumbnails, you actually have to go in there and render. So this has a clip art effect here on it. Um, and the way to avoid that is, Hey, where's the light source coming from? Okay. It's coming from here, form study time. And you're just adding whatever information you need to in order to make it look like this is no longer just a flat shadow puppet it is a full-on form that is darkened but has a light side that is facing the light source and actually I'm gonna make it like I'm just gonna copy what they did and that is no longer clip art 
You see that? I gave it volume. This one, hey, the light source coming from the far side. Let me just instant volume, bam, volume in a can. See that? It no longer has that clip art effect because you're actually bringing in a side of the cube. Clip art basically means you're not using, it's just a shadow puppet. It's not, it's just a, yeah, it's like a silhouette. It has nothing going on in there. But now that we did that, you know, we're having actual full volume. Maybe the light source is pretty strong nearby. And you just get rid of that, that weird feeling of that uh, flatness. Okay, um, this rock feels like it's sagging. Rocks don't sag. At least not noticeably enough for art before scientific blue balls hits in in my audience and they come in with, actually, sags do have been proven to sag over time. <laughs> <laughs> if you have, you know, just write a journal, you know, publish it. Don't, don't get on my ass. As far as I'm concerned, rocks don't sag, man. Actually, right. Anyway, you mentioned before about the importance of environmental washes. Um, is there a part two to that question? Okay, I was wondering, would you mind repeating what color wash you generally find during morning, midday, and evening? Uh, morning is a cool plus yellow, so very similar to this, meaning dawn, right? Very, very blue at dawn, and then gets more and more warm. Daytime, midday is a white yellow, very, very bright, extremely saturated, sharp shadows, lots of reflection, lots of bounce light, lots of specularity, like super white shines on cars, so white light and pure light blue sky. Midday is the same thing, a little bit more of a green, uh, the, the light is getting weaker, mixing with the blue and getting more into a green blue in the sky. And then evening, um, we have, <laughs> that's my cousin, the gaming lion. I love you too, Alush. Um, and then evening time is just right back into purple. So you have more blue. So the washes are purple, pink for morning, blue, light blue for e daytime, evening, navy purple okay so i'm um, gonna look at this one and this one does have the light source in it and it's a sunset but again who takes a photograph at night i mean very little cameras can even take a photograph at night um so what you need to do is <clears throat> because it's a light source, have you ever tried taking a light, a picture of a sun? It, it, any light source goes instantly um, no man's land value. I've talked about you're not allowed to use this value. You're just not allowed. There, are an ex there is an exception when it is a light source. If it's a candle and you're trying to paint that candle with grays, it's just going to look like a weird, uh, I don't know what it is going to look like. It's going to look like a balloon. It's not going to look like a, a candle, a real flame. Flame is energy. It's constant reactions, constant fire, constant stuff. You put your hand on it, it's going to burn because this is just so active. Uh, and that all that energy is being released. And that energy is released in light. And that light is at the maximum frequency, uh, maximum whatever the measurement term is. And that maximum is what we interpret as no man's land white. Okay? If you try to paint a sun... And the sun is this weird, uh, forgive me, I can't say it now because I know my cousin's in the eye. <laughs> I was going to say the Q word. Um, <laughs> because that, that sunlight here is this dark, it's not reading as enough brightness to even cause reflection or anything like that. So it needs to go up there. Because it's that up, that high up now, we can do some fun stuff. We can cast better shadows. We can give the water more strength. But anything that is a light source and it is not bright enough, I just call it a Q light. <laughs> I don't know if you guys know what I'm saying when I mean Q light. So there's the first reaction by the water. And then there is the rest of the water getting illuminated. And 
then what I do after that is hit two birds with one stone and that bright sky, the sky needs to be brightened as well. I'll do that after. But yeah, two birds with one stone. I need to uh, give this reflection here some edge work. And then it moves out into a, a, a more fuzzy edge. And then the bright sky, the sky needs to represent a better brightness. You have speckles here. Is that supposed to be the sunlight? If it, I mean, starlight, if it is, it's not that visible. Stars, unless they're like big ass stars or they're really close stars or they're like circumpolar stars, we're not going to see them that early during sunset. It's going to need a little bit more darkness. The night needs to be fully developed for us to really see them um, in action. All that cluster of stars. You're showing me this many. If we had this many stars near us at dusk and that was what we saw at dusk, yeah, it would be a very different universe. Very different galaxy, I mean. So what I'm doing here is I'm just going to brighten that sky up. Just like that, so it actually looks like eventually, you know, things go and dim out and the sun drops below, and that's when you can see those stars. And that's when everything goes black, except for that light on the pier. But because it's daytime, technically still, it's still day. Until the sun goes beneath the horizon line, it's still day. So we need to have this brightness level. So you had this and this. And I'm just going to darken the edges over here. <clears throat> so that's a, that's a lesson you have to remember. You can't have a picture at nighttime. You just can't. Um, you can have like multiple light sources at equal strength, including the sun, at sunset. That's something you can do, definitely. So we can give this guy, who is also a light source, some strength. And all these little pieces here also get their own strength. And they don't just move in one way, they move down as well. They kind of stretch down. Any kind of light stretches down because that water keeps moving towards us, elongating the reflection. And then you've got the space underneath each part of this pier that should be the water behind it. It's kind of just completely lost its silhouette. Whoa, Jesus. All right. And then you've got some more woodwork there, but I can't touch that. So we need to see this, you know, reflection of the of the moon back there through this. And it gets weaker as you go, but it doesn't just stop. And then finally, the reflection of the pier itself on the uh, the vertical on the ground over here. And that means it's a very messy job, low opacity. Filter, blur, Gaussian blur. So there's many, many levels and it's it all goes, it all just ends up falling into place. But as soon as you answer the question, what time of day is it? That's when it starts falling into place. All right, this whole section, I'm just going to brighten it. The light is coming in enough that we, we can see it like that. Sometimes you have clouds in the way over here. If you don't want the perfect sunlight just there, that's fine. And some of this can be hidden. That's fine too. And then we have the reflection of this mountain thingy majiggy. And then we have the reflection of this piece. And I 
again, you just go through it piece by piece, section by section, until it starts making sense. Um, if this is all city stuff, this would get brightened as well. Oops. If this is all city over here or town, it would not be that bright. There's just too much drowning light nearby, not letting that get brightened up as it needs. Um, these little lights here, they don't get that bright in that area because the sunlight overtakes them. They only start looking bright when you get into the darker half of the canvas. So it's a very, very confusing time of day that you chose. Also beneath the cloud level is some more horizon lines. So that means that around the horizon line, just at the line of the horizon that is now eating up the sun, we have just like a line of light right there. Do you see how that just fully completes it? That's because the sun is there. The sun is there causing this. And even if the clouds are strong and thick, they're not thick enough to deny the light of the sun completely. And then just at the top of the painting, the top half, we are starting to get nighttime shift in. And I'm going to darken one half over the other. And this kind of is just like the last minute polish choices that you do with your soft brush. And you can bring in some more clouds. You can bring in some more stuff that will help you discern from, let me see if I can fix it with the levels. There we go. You can bring in some more of this stuff. So it's starting to look like a sunset scene. Maybe it's too dark now that I added that stuff. It's okay, I'll fix it. And then the atmospheric fade needs to happen on this distant mountain section. And I'm just gonna relighten the background really, really quick. Too dark. See? So there's a lot of like science and photographs in this and if you study the photograph you will kind of get some of this in your visual library. You will kind of understand it um, a little bit better. Here you can throw a star or two. At this point you can throw the star. But outside of what you missed here, I feel like there's even more light needed down here for the pier. Um, this reflection of the pier shouldn't be all over, but the pier is casting a shadow on the water, which is stretching even over here into the into the shore. But over here, we wouldn't have this much, you know, disappearing. We would still have some of this light over here on this part of the canvas. I think it's was just way too little contrast for a sunset scene. If you've ever seen sunset photographs, they're very, very high contrast. It's very difficult for a photographer to take a photograph of a sunset um, and not have it just be naturally high contrast because you get nothing but silhouettes and the light behind. Everything in a state is a state of silhouette. Everything is clip art. And what you had is the exact lack of that. And that's why it just looked so washed out. It looked so non-sunset. Um, and this is sunset just really close to the horizon or being eaten up by the horizon. Um, if you can see, it's always some kind of high contrast. So what I did is bring in the contrast, but with, both with the light and the, the cast shadow of the, um, of the silhouette of the pier. And that's as much as I can do for now. But you need to be able to um, like build better, better contrasts in, in your work, be able to see better contrast. Um, areas that have levels of ground to them, so stuff like this, you still get atmospheric fade. So I recommend like completely fading off this distant section. Um, lighten. But yeah, Arabs. Uh, Arab family, I know like in some families it's really weird to tell your cousin that you love them, but my cousins and I were always telling each other we love each other. Still we practically grew up together, so. I don't know if your families are like that, but Arabs, oh man. Just give them, at the drop of a penny, they'll tell you they love you. <laughs> There's so much love. I know it's very unusual considering what we hear in the news, but very passionate people. <laughs> Get very angry too. <laughs> 
So I'm just throwing that into some uh, darkness, but just take a look at how bright the sky still is. You see just the clouds are coming through, creating a silhouette as well. But the clouds and the sky are still pretty bright. They're not, they're definitely not nighttime scene. What the heck? They're definitely not nighttime scenes. So night photograph, <laughs> let's take a look. It's just, you need some kind of light. You need some kind of bounce light. And it's not even night photography. It's no, it's just bunch of light photography. It's fireworks. It's just fireworks. This isn't night photography, okay? This picture of this cat always stresses me out. <clears throat> All right, so if you're actually taking a picture at night, <laughs> you don't get anything unless there's some light nearby. Um, so if that's what you were going for, a really, really dark scene, not the best choice you could have made for this setup. There are pictures of it like a pier at night um, that you could have looked at. Where is that? Did I really throw that over here? No, no, no. Why is it doing this to me? Anyway, who cares? Um, here at night. And you can find yourself some good choices here. Some, some like, better stuff. So the only way we see this pier is because of the silhouette it has against the background and the sky is the same val value all the way. We have the reflection on the water. The reflection is revealing the texture of the water. We have actual surface texture by the waves, and then we have the reflections of these little lights. Do you see how they're vertical? Because the water is drawing to us, and the, vert and the, and the picture is a little distorted in the water. Um, and again, the water, the light of the water is, the light on the water is reveal revealing the texture of the water. The sun is not in the scene. If there is a sunlight nearby, if there was a sunset, the photographer chose not to take a picture of it. You just don't take a picture of the sun. Um, it's, it's when you do, it just looks like this and or sun photo. You, you don't actually either, either you get this sunset or or you just get this washed out blinding Helios trying to burn your eyeballs off or you get lots of really pretty the fo prettiest photographs of the sun are just over here. But other than that, it's just a big, mean thing. And if you're trying to put a character in here, it, this is going to just draw all the attentions. King of the world is the sun. Okay. But that's pretty much it. I hope you are kind of seeing your mistakes here. That you need a little bit more appreciation for the amount of contrast in the sunset in your rendition. Is Are there any questions at all about the correction today? About these... Uh, changes I've made. There were other questions I didn't look at because I had to rush into the... <clears throat> um, is it at all possible for you to do a class on how to properly use layers in Photoshop? It's really hard to find resources about the subject and I'm feeling really lost. Um, you mean you haven't done a YouTube search of how to use Photoshop layer modes? Um, I, I, I think they're pretty self-explanatory. All I can say about them right now is, let me just drag something in, is each layer behaves differently with contrast and with the color underneath it. There isn't one rule per, air, per layer uh, mode because it, other than what it's describing, it's pretty, like, it just describes what each layer does. Um, but there are things that they do specifically, but they do them differently between each color. So there isn't even one formula, go to darken for this effect. Um, it's, it's go to darken for this effect if you're using this shade uh, specifically. Um, white practically does nothing in all these layers. Um, black does nothing in all these layers. It's mostly in the midtones. And if you're not experimenting with them and you're waiting for a lesson on how to, there's very little the lesson can provide for you or illuminate for you because there isn't one set value that works one specific way that I can promise you will behave if you use it in any one of these modes. It works differently between each mode. Uh, grayscale will look wonderful in one value, even though I told you it might not because you chose the, the right kind of grayscale or something like that. But you take that same grayscale and use it for you know, pin light, you're not going to get anything. Um, it's screen gets rid of all the black in a picture and leaves only the values that are 
white and uh, anything non-black. So it's good if you're trying to overlay like a, a photo of a fire and it's just pure black, I'm trying to get that texture in. Uh, most of these are for photo bashing. If you are interested in photo bashing, which in my opinion is not painting, um, the photograph is doing everything for you. If you do have a history of knowing how to render, photo bashing can be done with, a, with, with some expertise and some consciousness and uh, some like really nice monitoring um, skill. Uh, but again, if you if you do that's just a side opinion. But if you are photo bashing, you're using a lot of these. The only one that's the ones that I use, as you can see, the ones I use the most are color for color correction and teaching. I usually mostly don't use those. I use them as a brush mode. You also can get them as a brush mode. Um, I use darken and lighten. Darken darkens anything that is lighter than the value I've chosen, and lighten dark lightens anything darker than the value I've chosen. I don't know if that makes sense. I don't even know if I said that right. But again, I can't describe it unless you guys use it. And I can't, I can't explain it to you unless you guys use it. Um, um, <clears throat> let me see some other questions. Why are your lasso doodles better than my studies? <laughs> Marvelous. Thank you. <laughs> Um, is the sun really yellow? Uh, if the sun is yellow, then how is the sky blue? Uh, the sky is blue because of our atmosphere, and our atmosphere uh, does a little prism effect when the sunlight goes through it. The earth is so massive, we only get one part of the rainbow caused by the light through our atmosphere. So that's how huge the earth is. We are so close up, we are so zoomed in to the rainbow, let's say, um, to kind of just uh, say it very, very topically that we're so close to the rainbow caused by the sun through the air in our atmosphere that it's working like a, a prism that we can only see the blue part um, in a specific time of day. The darker we get, the lower the sun gets, the more angled the um, rainbow is, that rainbow caused by the prism. So we get the other half of that rainbow, and so we're getting more cool values. And those are the oranges and the purples that we see in the sky. But the sun is a yellow white. It is a yellow dwarf. It is not a high mass star. It is a low mass star. That means that it is not the most powerful kind of star there is. It's a very weak star, relatively, and very young. Um, and it is yellow. It is not blue. It does. It has more of one chemical than another burning inside it, causing all those constant nuclear explosions <clears throat> um, that is, that are our beautiful sun. If we put the character in the foreground, how should we? How should the painting process be? You just start, you know, you just get a value that is lighter than usual and darker than usual to differentiate between areas that are getting light and areas that are not. You don't just get bright lights that you used in the fore in the sky on the foreground. Every ground level has its rules, and you just follow those rules as you go. Uh, meaning you can only go so light and so dark, and you have restrictions per foreground, middle ground, or background. You don't share values in between grounds. <clears throat> what is the definition of mature in art? Just well-guided design-wise, not cheesy choices and excessive saturation, cheesy placement and um, uh, ca canvas setting or composition, um, cheesy and the things that are reused and rehashed over and over in a scene using overusing dodge tool is very fucking cheesy and very immature and I don't respect any artist that overuses dodge tool to help them paint. Dodge tool is a very specific tool for a very specific need and a very specific kind of value range and that's the only time you use it. If you don't know how to lighten and you're only using dodge tool um, to just get you through from point A to point finished um, you're not doing anything all by yourself. You're just making the value climb, and it's gonna, it's like, you know when like, um, when, when a wizard uses too much power too soon, and they kind of just explode, and the power takes over them? Most of the time, these artists that overuse dodge tool don't have the skill to know how to use it, and how to, how to handle that flame, so that flame, which it's very, it's just like fire, it's like wildfire, dodge tool is not easy to use, and so they end up using it too much, and that means they're immature. They don't know how to use it yet. They don't have the skill level yet. Immature just means young, in my opinion. Sometimes it also means, like, immature, like they don't have the <laughs> um, uh, grounded taste uh, to, to, to use it properly and know when it's just looking gross and 
shiny and plasticky and see-through and all the grossness that comes with um, not knowing how to use your mid-tones. <clears throat> um, um, daytime, are all colors visible? Yes, they are. In daytime, all colors are visible. Um, at equal saturation, some colors need a little bit more to be boosted, but if yellow gets to be as full as yellow needs to be, and yellow is the brightest and most temperamental of the colors, if it doesn't get the exact amount of exposure, it's going to turn into baby vomit or baby diarrhea, then all the other colors will be just fine because they are way less temperamental than yellow. <clears throat> um, let me see if there's more uh, questions. The ground looks too pink. You can make it pink. It could be just the kind of sediment or the kind of com composition in the rocks that reflects the light in a certain way. It could just be the wash. The wash here is definitely pink, definitely purple. I don't like saying pink because pink is such a non, it's such a like a sub color of many other colors. You can have a purple pink, you can have a red pink. Pink is very nondescript. I like to stick to the primary and secondaries. So this is a very purple wash. Amaris, exactly like that art. <laughs> um, so yeah. Um, <clears throat> okay. Uh, have you ever used luminosity masks? No, I don't mess around with masks at all. I try not to use too much Photoshop stuff. It's, I try to keep things as one layer, as close to traditional as possible. Another cheesy thing, an immature thing that you could do in your art is use too many layers. And you might use too many layer modes. You just only need so many. You only need so much luxury before you just start abusing the digital craft. I mean, we're always getting people on our asses saying our digital format is not real art. Stick to as close to stick stick a close as close to traditional as possible, and use as little as you can. I don't recommend masks. I don't have a feeling they have much use. It's nice to keep things clean and not have to erase away and repaint every time you're adjusting. But if you're adjusting so much, it means you didn't plan much in the early stages. And again, it goes right back into, into traditional. <clears throat> Okay, I think that's it. Um, uh, I think that's, <laughs> that's it for all these questions. It's very, very late today. I'm sorry about the delay today. Um, the challenge that is currently up in the community is the Circus of the Absurd. Please make sure that you are, uh, if you want to join, you are reading the rules. There typically aren't any rules other than the fact that it has to be a functional design and a, and a sentient character. It can't be a melting clock with wings that tells you, um, that answers a question with a, with, a, with a question. It can't be just some silly, actually that was pretty cool. Um, but it, it, it just has to be a sentient creature. So it can be a, a clock that flies around and talks. But if you can just give it some characterization, if you can give it eyes that are in different parts of its body, if you can give it a hand, and the other thing is a pair of scissors. I don't know, um, but there's just so much fun to be had in this, but as, uh, without some restriction, it's just gonna be chaos and the fun factor is gone. It has to be a functional, applicable character. Imagine you're designing it for a, a game that uses absurd characters or for a movie that, you know, where inanimate objects come to life and they start behaving like sentient creatures, but you know, they combine with the nearest object near them and they more mutated into this weird, macabre, absurd, ridiculous thing. It doesn't have to be scary. It doesn't have to be all about Halloween. You don't have to draw witches and goblins. Uh, but, it, but it does have to have that uncanniness factor to it, but not fully uncanny. Um, <laughs> just, just watch the Tim Burton uh, Alice in Wonderlands. Uh, watch the, um, anything Tim Burton really is great as an example. He isn't always about Halloween, but he knows how to keep it ridiculous. Um, sometimes he just goes full Halloween and it gets kind of cheesy. <clears throat> but, uh, yeah, you can go Halloween if you want, but just try to stay creative. Don't just draw me a witch flying a broom. Uh, try to give it something new. Um, yeah, I'm going to lose my voice in a little bit. <clears throat> I'm going to be try. I'm going to try to design a character, yeah. Um, I'm going to try to, maybe tonight I'll host an after hours and just draw something. Uh, but that's going to be it. Thank you everyone for watching. Have a great day, guys. Bye.